Let's turn to the word of God. Today we are going to uh, talk about the covenant with Noah. And it's called the Noahic covenant. It's kind of hard to pronounce. The way to do it is say Noah, Noahic. <laughs> Noahic covenant. That's the way to pronounce it. And I was looking at the word Noah and what it means. It sounds so good. Say with me, Noah. It sounds so good. It actually means rest. Noah means rest. And the Lord was speaking to me, saying, you need to rest more. Um, even as I was starting the preparation, the first thing the Lord said is, you need to rest more. And I think there is a word for some of you here or some of you watching. Uh, you know, we can rest in God. You know, let's not be about a flurry of activity. You know, Bay Area is, there are people running around like chickens with their heads cut off. I'm sure you've seen some of them in your workplaces. I'm not talking about the chickens, but people. <laughs> and we all need to learn to rest, Simon. You know, we all need to rest, especially, and the Lord was putting first myself. He said, you need to rest. You're going to speak on Noah. Noah means rest. And God will give us rest. You know, we need to keep the Sabbath. We need to rest well. And of course, pastors are preparing on Saturday. So the Lord is putting on my heart, find time to rest. And, and I just challenge all of you to find time to rest. I think the, in the hustle bustle of the culture we live in, we always are planning the next thing. It could even be a birthday party and still we are not rested, okay? You know, you might be going to the next event, but rest enough. In Genesis 6 and 5, you know, you read the story about Noah in Genesis 6 through 10. A lot of time has been given to Noah. That means it is important. God didn't mention Noah in passing and just forgot about it, but... The covenant with Noah is important and it's still valid for us today. Even more than the Mosaic covenant, I, you can argue and you can debate about that. Genesis 6 and 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord even regretted making man at some point, seeing the evil things that were going on in the world. And there was a lot of violence. Uh, even children were being sacrificed. There was sexual immorality. And when I was reading uh, about that, I could relate to even what's happening now. You know, violence and killing of babies. 66 plus million babies have been aborted. And sexual immorality in the culture. Uh, and I don't have to emphasize that. We know, we know it. And all the drag shows that are going on in libraries. And it's just so pathetic what's happening in the culture. But it's not so different from what was happening during Noah's time. And that was really, God was angry at what was happening in the culture. And he was ready to judge uh, the human race. And that's why we need repentance. And we, we ask God to relent from the judgment, uh, even on America. And even Billy Graham said, you know, if, uh, if God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, then if he doesn't judge America, it's not fair for Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm rephrasing what Billy Graham said. And I think when we look at the culture, we need to feel that burden in our hearts. And, and even though the culture is different, Noah was a man who was righteous and walking blameless before God. You know, we can do it and our children can do it. Though the culture is like Babylon, still there can be a Daniel who prays three times a day. Though the culture is so violent and even uh, sexually immoral and so many other things, still we can live a godly life and Noah really proves us that it is possible for us to do that. And the covenant, the whole idea of covenant is a contract 
between two parties. And here, God is initiating the covenant with Noah. And God wants to judge the human race, and he wanted to eliminate entirely, but he sees Noah is righteous. Noah is perfect in his generations. Noah is walking blameless and righteous before me. I cannot destroy the entire human race. It's more like a recreation and restart or a reset, as we might say in the technology world, a reset, you know. And that's what God wanted to uh, do because Noah was righteous and he wanted to continue with the human race, if you will. You know, Genesis 6 and 13 says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. You know, God also has emotions. He can also be angry at what's happening in the culture. And he was angry and he wanted to judge and he regretted even creating the human race. But still, the grace of God always come in, comes into play. Always. I was reading Ezekiel this week and again, he's, he's sharing about how there is so much abomination in the culture. But then at the end, God always comes back with a message of grace. You know, that is our God. That's, that's why we have hope. And that's why we continue to pray for America. You know, we don't say it's a post-Christian nation. I will never say that. It is not a post-Christian nation. I would always say there is a Christian remnant that has a great hunger for God, that has a great righteousness in them, that is walking perfect before God, that is walking blameless before God, and they will Bring in the revival that is needed. Let's give a hand to the Lord. You know, and, and Noah was not perfect. That's why it says, God showed grace upon Noah. Nobody is perfect, we know that. But he had a heart for God. He had a heart for righteousness. He wanted to walk blameless before God. That's what God is expecting. He's not sitting up there and saying, Raj, you didn't do this right. You know, God doesn't work like that. He's just saying, you need to do this. You need to change this. Word of God is like a mirror. When we read, you know, God will speak to you. He'll convict our hearts and say, you need to change your ways here. You know, you need to forgive someone, even as we did that during the worship time. You know, nobody's perfect. We might have hurt someone. So just forgive and keep moving forward. That's the right approach. Genesis 6 and 14 talks about a clear direction from the Lord. You know, our God is a detail-oriented God. At the same time, he also sees the big picture. You know, I like that about our God. I mean, he'll give the exact measurements of the ark. He'll say, use go for word. This is the length. This is the width. This is the height. You know, and... Uh, theologians say it took like 120 years for Noah to build the ark. And think about all the work that went in. All the work that went in. And I think those who build in wood, I am not a builder by any stretch of the imagination. You know that. I think we have some amazing builders. Simon does a good job. Sam and others. Maybe others as well. I might not have mentioned your name. And uh, I think Hannah has a great uh, sense of design. You know, these are gifts from God. And Noah had a clear uh, direction from the Lord. This is how you build it. You know, God always, and even to Moses, with so much clarity he gave, this is how you need to build it. Because his requirements are clear to him first, and then he will assign it and give that dream to someone to execute. And so God used Noah to build the ark. And, and theologians say that the ark would have been kept at a higher place because if it, if it was at ground level, then there would be much dew in the ground and the wood will rot soon. And it took 120 years to build. So think about Noah's patience. You know, we, we want to drive through and 
get our Chick-fil-A and we're rushing to the next party, Hannah, <laughs> you know. And uh, Noah was patient. You know, everyone else, think about this, everyone else in the culture was busy doing things of life and also they were not following God. Think about that. Will we still obey God and pursue God? That is what Noah did. And that's why God had grace on him. And Genesis 6 and 17, uh, 18 says, but, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark. You, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. So eight of them were spared out of the entire population of the world. You know, God wanted to reset and restart and start clean. And, and obviously things, the human race always goes back to sin. And we see that even in Noah's life later. And we are not going to touch that now, but... Um, but God is still so gracious. You know, first we are going to look at the terms of the covenant. Say with me, the terms of the covenant. So we are going to read an agreement, okay? And for me, legal agreements, I don't read it fully. And I will not ask you, and I know you don't read it as well. You know, how many times we have scrolled down the terms of agreement and boom, you just agreed to sign off your entire assets. So Genesis 8 and 21, the terms of the covenant. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I'll never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. You know, this covenant is still true for us, you know. And it gives us, uh, it gives us uh, uh, affirmation that God is not going to destroy the entire human race. You know, he's, he's not going to be destroying the earth again like what he did during the time of Noah. And then Genesis 8 and 22 says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. And again, when we look at this promise that is given to Noah, you know, it gives us stability you know that the sun will rise and the sun will set. You know there is going to be a summer, there is going to be a winter. You know when to actually plant, when to harvest. You know there is consistency and stability. You know even our walk with the Lord is, it should not be one, way, one day up and one day down. It's more God wants us to rest in Him. You know, we need to walk with him and be patient with him. God doesn't do things in a hurry. Though we want things to happen in a hurry. And, you know, as some preachers say, God is never late. He's on time. But he's also never too early. You know, because he, he wants our faith to grow. He wants us to walk by faith. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to walk with him and enjoy that fellowship. You know, even like Jerry plays the drums, enjoying that worship. You know, when you pray, when you read the word, enjoy it. Because there are so many things that you learn, even as you read the word, as you study it, you look at different commentaries, and I enjoy preparing for the sermons. You know why? Because if I don't have to speak, I will probably not do it. <laughs> You know, but it is so enjoyable once you get into it <clears throat> to read these commentaries and look at some amazing things and the same commentaries that were available to George Whitfield are available to us. You know, we have no reason. I want all of us to study the Bible. You know, it's, it, you can spend hours and still you'll be refreshed. Even at one o'clock in the morning, you will be refreshed trying to connect some verses, and it really brings the revelation to your heart, grows your faith, and prepare your hearts as well to fellowship with the Lord. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, you know, and even as we talked about giving, and um, was an amazing word on giving, there's so much in the Bible about giving, because 
it's, it's a seed time and harvest. It, it is always a principle for our life, and we have learned it by experience, you know, by experience. And it's when you sow a seed, you will reap a harvest, and you will reap a harvest which is similar to the seed, the nature of the seed. That is the principle because God put the seed of the fruit in the fruit. You know, so if you sow an apple seed, you will reap an apple harvest. If you sow a seed for a building project somewhere else, and we have done it so many times, I believe you'll reap a bountiful harvest of a large building that somebody might even say, hey, we have this building, do you want it? And you know our answer is yes. <laughs> Let's believe for the miracle because we are not, um, we are not um, people who are scrambling or begging God. You know, God has kept us as, as his children who will do his work with the provision that he provides. And at the right time, I believe you will have an amazing building to execute the vision that the Lord has given us. Let's give a hand and let's keep sowing the seed into even other visions. You know, when somebody calls us saying, hey, we are in the middle of a building project. Guess what? We will sow. You know, because there is a need for us. So we know the principle of seed time and harvest. And the whole promise God gave here is for our stability. We know different seasons are going to come. We know uh, it is uh, fall back and we got one more hour of sleep. So thank God for that. <laughs> you know, and... It gives us more stability to know that these are things, cold and heat, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, we can plan our time, you know, and God gives this for consistency. And Genesis 9 really clarifies the covenant step by step. We might not have time to look at all the verses, but Genesis 9, 1 to 17 actually covers the uh, covenant in detail. Before that, it is in sprinkling and what God wants to do. But in detail, in Genesis 9, 1 through 17, which we read, it gives us in detail. And we'll read a few verses. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You know, it reminds us of Genesis 1 and 2 because it, God is now restarting and it's a similar promise given to Adam that was given to Noah be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Because he had to restart for reasons of violence and immorality, and he is now giving the assignment to Noah, be fruitful and multiply and, fear the, and uh, fill the earth. And then he talks about, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. There is a difference between the Adamic covenant and the Noahic covenant because for Adam, you know, all these animals came to him and he named them. So there was no fear. The animals didn't fear man in the beginning, before the fall. So the fear came only after the fall. And here, and again, we know that, right? Sometimes we when we go for hiking and other things and people tell us, hey, if you, if you see a mountain lion or a bear, you know, I asked Sam last time when we were going on a hike uh, at the uh, retreat, you know, and we were having a conversation, uh, you know, the animals are afraid of us, Rabbi, <laughs> you know, and we should know that. And uh, sometimes it's the other way around when the only thing uh, they they will attack us if they feel that we are attacking their children or, you know, uh, if there is, they, they'll attack us out of fear, actually. So I think if we, as people say, if you are going to behave like big in front of a bear, the bear might just walk away. That's just additional tips for your hiking as you go. The point is, the point is, the animal started fearing man after the fall. It's interesting. And the good news is, in the millennial reign of Jesus, after the second coming, you know, we'll go back to the uh, place where the animals and even children will live in amazing peace. 
And in fact, the animals will become uh, uh, vegetarian again, believe it or not. And Isaiah 11 and 6 talks about it. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. You know, so definitely we need to understand these covenants so that we understand what's happening around us. You know, it's relevant for us to understand the covenants. All animals will be vegetarian during the thousand year reign. Even the bear that was, uh, that typically can attack the food and if you leave it outside, um, these animals, even the wild animals will be vegetarian if you will. Genesis 9 and 3 talks about every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. You know, everything shall be food for you. And actually, before the fall, even the human race was vegetarian. This is the first time God is allowing us to uh, eat meat, if you will. Can we thank God for that? <laughs> you know, and... Uh, I don't know. Some of you probably are vegetarians, but, but we all enjoy our barbecue. And there are some here, I'll not name names, who do an amazing job and, uh, in barbecue and things like that. It's, it's very interesting to understand these covenants, even the simple things. You know, there is a reason why. And the Word of God has answers to every why that you have. And, and as you read, and God will actually answer it only when you start studying. You know, he's not going to give it to you on a platter. Sometimes he does. Sometimes you are thinking about something and somebody will come and say, you know what, I read this word and I learned this, and that is the answer you are looking for, you know. And, but sometimes God will ask us, you go study. You know, you spend time with me. Because he's a God who wants fellowship. The whole idea of even creating man is he wanted fellowship and he wants us to worship him and to spend time with him. And the angels cannot do that job because they are not created in the image of God and only man is created in the image of God. <clears throat> in Genesis 9, surely for your lifeblood I'll demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast, I'll require it, and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I'll require the life of man. And that's talking about even the capital punishment. Um, you know, the capital punishment, and there is obviously a lot of debate on this, whether we should have capital punishment or not, but, um, but I, it is biblical. If you, if you murder someone, and the capital punishment is okay, because what happens is, uh, and we'll not delve too much on, too much on this, uh, what happens is there is a fear, which actually then deters them from doing that, um, you know. And the reason for that is in verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. You know, and that's why uh, I think the argument against uh, capital punishment um, is easy, and we can defeat that argument. But I don't know on which side you are, so I'm not going to delve on this too much. Uh, verse 7 says, and as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. And he wanted again the earth to be uh, uh, replenished back and for men and women to be there and to uh, have fellowship with him and have dominion uh, over the creation. You know, that is one of the uh, Adamic covenants as well, that you'll have dominion over the creation, not dominion over other people, but dominion over the creation. And of course, there is a structure, an authority structure in families and in organizations, but we need to dominate our purpose. We need to dominate what God has assigned to us and, uh, and, and move forward with great faith, with that heart of dominion, if you will. Verse 10 talks about, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. It's actually talking about establishing a covenant. The covenant is not just for Noah, but for all the descendants. So we are also covered, and not only us, but even the cattle and every all creation. You know, the Noah's covenant is actually with everyone, not just, uh, not just Noah. It's very interesting. And verse 17 
talks about, and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. That's the rainbow. And I mean, how many love rainbows? I, I love rainbows just to uh, watch the beauty of a rainbow. And sometimes there are multiple, and uh, it's just beautiful. And that's a sign of the covenant with God that this Noahic covenant is going to continue. And he sees that, it reminds me. It's like a sign. It's like a wedding ring. A wedding ring is a sign of the covenant of marriage. And, and the ring is uh, circular because there is no beginning point or ending point. So our love for our spouse is not conditional. Uh, you know, it is, it is agape love which continues. It's more like a sign of that covenant. So that's the terms of the covenant. Let's talk about a couple of other things that caught my attention. Number two, I want to say, just say with me, but Noah. Genesis 6 and 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, and God is going, his eyes are going to and fro throughout the whole earth, and he is he knows loyal hearts. He knows people who are tirelessly working for the kingdom. He knows the sacrifices that uh, have been done even in this room. He has seen uh, the time that you have come in early and have left the, uh, the last. You know, he has seen the time that you have cleaned the room and set the chairs and we thank God that we have a facility now. We used to have a time when we used to be setting chairs every Sunday. In fact, not only setting chairs, I remember the days of bringing the speakers in. And those were not very light speakers, Rabbi. I mean, I remember the King's Pride, 2006, 2007. I was in charge of media, believe it or not, Raj. <laughs> and the speakers were this high. And they were heavy. So we will need kind of the dolly uh, to carry it from home, from the garage. So that's why we bought the van. When we bought the van, Sister Lindsay, our only consideration was, can we fit everything in this van when we go for the service? Believe it or not. And we actually took our keyboard to buy the van. And we were checking. Does it fit? OK, we like the van. <laughs> It's all good. It's worth it, you know, because when God gives a vision, you just pursue it with all your might. And I know many people sitting in this room have been overwhelmed in certain cases, but I want to encourage you that every seed that you have sown, the seed of time, the seed of tears, the seed of prayer, the seed of coming early and leaving late, God has not forgotten. He will compensate he is a God of seed time and harvest. It's going to be a hundredfold harvest for everyone who has felt overwhelmed at some point. Let's give a hand to the Lord. It's a hundredfold harvest that you're going to reap. I know that. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I like that verse. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's why I said earlier, Noah was not perfect. Though he was walking blameless before God, he was not perfect. You know, he, he obviously was human and he fell short of the glory of God. But God saw his heart. God saw that he wants to be righteous. He was worshipping the Lord. He, he didn't care about how the culture was. He had his own values. He had his values of honoring God, of obeying God, of walking with the Lord. And he then got the grace in the eyes of the Lord because he was determined. I think we all need to be determined to pursue God. You know, whatever is happening outside, you know, our values need to be firm. See, if the values are firm, it's easy for us to make decisions. Because if we, if we are not rock solid on values, then people will change the direction in which you head. You know, our values need to be consistent. And God saw, saw that in Noah, and that's why I gave him that grace and favor. You know, and then it talks about, of course, he was perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. And perfect doesn't mean he didn't sin at all, because he was human. He was just 
mindful of God and he pursued God. And that's what God is expecting. You know, he's not asking us to be perfect, but he's asking us if we fall short, then ask for forgiveness. And he's always available uh, to us. And he walked with God, meaning he, he heard from the Lord. He had fellowship with God. You know, I don't think they had scriptures in that time. And, you know, what a great opportunity we have. We have scriptures in different versions, and we have audio Bible, and so many ways. You know, now people are talking about chat GPT and trying to uh, work on different uh, types of Bible, different applications. And, of course, some are saying, let's, let's put in some videos. And it's, it's amazing the access that we have in terms of resources to understand the word, even bring it in video. I mean, there is no reason for us not to study the word and, and have fellowship with the Lord. If Noah can walk with God with, with almost nothing in terms of scriptures, just the presence of the Lord, uh, then we can too, you know. And of course, Enoch as well, and we should walk with the Lord. And the, as he built the ark, it was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall. I was just thinking how long it would have taken Noah to uh, build. I think it was 120 years. But think about it. Every day, get up in the morning, and probably he, he was cutting trees for 45 years. I don't know. I'm just giving an example. <laughs> Think about it. Every day in the morning, Praveen, you have to get up and log trees. And some people are laughing at you. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building an ark. There's going to be a flood. You know, it has never rained before that. And you are still saying, I'm going to obey God despite how long it takes. You know, sometimes it's easier to obey God for a day. But then how about 25 years? about 120 years, you know, without seeing anything. It's like only the instruction from the Lord. I'm going to destroy the human race. You build an ark to save the family. You know, we need to build an ark for our own families. And I'm glad we have family prayers. I'm glad we have the children's ministry, the preteens ministry. That's like building an ark for them. You know, the church is like an ark. Church becomes an ark to bring people in, to, to bless them, to pray for them, to uh, encourage them, to inspire them. You know, it's, it gives, it's, it is a shadow. The ark is a shadow of the church. It could also be a shadow for a family. And we need to be, really be mindful of our family, make sure our family is pursuing God, our family is is right there in that ark, if you will. You know, the ark can even represent a cross. You know, once you, uh, once you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, then your eternity is secured. And the ark is made of gopher wood, and we have a wooden cross. So it can also be a shadow of the cross. And it's, it's very, very interesting how God established a covenant with Noah. And also, his faith is commendable. And in Hebrews 11 and 7, it says, By faith, Noah. Say with me. By faith, Noah. Think about his faith. Abraham, even Abraham, the Lord is putting this on my heart. When Abraham took a side road, and we call him the father of our faith, Noah kept at it for 120 years. You know, what a trust in God. Despite people around him not really supporting anything that he was saying, it says, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. See, if somebody warns you and say, says, hey, a flood is coming. And there has never been a flood or there has never been rain. What would you say? You must be kidding me. What flood? <laughs> that is faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. 
So Noah was divinely warned of things not yet seen. That's why the, I believe Hebrews was written by Paul. I don't see anybody else writing Hebrews. Um, but we can argue that later because people, uh, people argue that by faith Noah. Mood with godly fear. You know, the fear of God is so important. And we need to pray for the fear of God to really come and be there in the nation. We need godly fear. I think that will do it in terms of the nation turning to God. And then it says, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You know, Noah's faith is definitely unique in the scriptures, especially the time. You know, that is the test of your faith. Can you hang on to the promise of God through thick and thin? More through thin than thick. It's easy to hang on to the promise of God when you're at the top of the mountain. You know, but when we are in the valley, can you still believe that even the Goliath that you are facing will be slain because Goliath was slain in the valley. You know, God is expecting us to walk by faith and he's telling us that you can slay the giant that you are facing, but we need to walk with the Lord and have continued faith. You know, we salute Noah for he walked by faith. He was divinely warned of things that were not seen. That is, that is Noah for us. And he moved with godly fear. It's amazing. Yeah, 120 years to work on building a boat. I don't know if Moni would do it. Uh, 120 years, Moni. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, the kind of faith it ne is needed to uh, walk with the Lord. And I like this quote, Charles Spurgeon's quote says, with perseverance, the snail reached the ark. I just love it. Let's give a hand to the Lord and the hand to Charles Spurgeon. What an amazing man of God. You know, very young pastor in UK, of course, in, uh, in 1800s. You know, sometimes we have to go back to the old paths. The word of God also says that. And there is amazing revelation. There is amazing insight. There is amazing walk with the Lord for these people. They were, they really were meaning business, Sister Mimi. They walked with the Lord. God spoke to them. And I remember somebody uh, shared with me that even as Charles Spurgeon was speaking, in the room below the pulpit, people were praying, Raj. They were praying for the word of God to go forth because the word of God grows our faith. That's how leaders are developed. So I know God is doing work here, even in the blessing to equip us to do amazing things for God. With perseverance, the snail reached the ark. I like that. And the last one, Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Say with me, Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Second Peter 2 and 5 says, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. I mean, think about Noah building this ark, Simon, on top of a mountain for 120 years. And I think that, was, that mountain was his pulpit. So after he had cut some trees, you know, he used to preach from there saying, Repent and turn back to God. Go away from your violent ways. And he was preaching. He was a preacher of righteousness for all these years. And think about nobody turning to God. Think about that. How much discouragement Noah would have gone through. Well, I've been preaching righteousness at them for 120 years. Not even one turn to God. I believe he had to also preach to his own children, to his wife. Because God only talks about Noah, that he was perfect in his generations. So I believe he got seven souls. Let's give a hand to the Lord. You know, seven souls. I remember William Carey's story, Rabbi. And... 
for the first seven years, he did not have any soul saved. Um, think about it, somebody traveling from UK, coming to India, losing his wife, and, um, and those days, obviously, the hygiene was not that good. Uh, you know, it's easy to go to Hawaii to suffer for God. Going to India in 1800s or 1700s and doing the mission work, it needs a real calling of God and real commitment. And for seven years, absolutely no soul saved and you can get discouraged. But then we have to continue on. You know, God is looking for faithful people who will continue to walk by faith, continue to believe the promises, continue to believe what God has given you as an assignment and, and he will do it. He was a preacher of righteousness. And in this time, we all need to become preachers of righteousness. You know, it's not much different. The days that we live in, we see a lot of violence. We see so many shootings that are happening in schools and malls and so many places. But God will keep us safe even as we go and pray in the schools and, and in different institutions. Intercessors will be kept safe. I know that. So pray for your schools. Pray for your children's schools. Go and attend the board meetings. Be part of that process. It's important. And be a preacher of righteousness everywhere, in your neighborhood, at the workplace. Take time to have those conversations and ask God for the doors to open. You will see that they will come. They will come and you will be able to have those conversations. And a friend of mine, I had forgotten about this friend, it's an acquaintance, John Murphy, and he had come for the Bonnie Bray House uh, gathering in 2017, and he texted me. In fact, he was trying to reach me, and I didn't recognize the name, so I didn't pick up the call. And uh, then the Lord said, and he called another time, and said, the Lord said, take it. And then I figured out, oh, this is John Murphy from uh, the Bonnie Bray House prior. He had come there. So he has connected me to another person, an Indian gentleman who's looking and seeking the Lord. And I already texted him and I've invited him for uh, the church service uh, next Sunday. So uh, I'm sure he's going to come. God will connect us. And uh, even as everyone knows that we are, uh, we are preachers of righteousness, they will call you saying, hey, are you still preaching righteousness? <laughs> Let me send someone so you can preach righteousness to them. I know it's important. Even the mall outreach, the October 31st, I think it was a great experience for all of us uh, to even go out and give those packets. I always wonder how uh, Lindsay can give 1,000 packets. Let's give a hand to her. I mean, that's a true evangelist calling on your life. I just bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Let that mighty call come true for Sister Lindsay. Thank you, Jesus. God is going to raise up uh, prophets and pastors and evangelists and apostles and pastors uh, and teachers from the Blessing Church. I just know it. And uh, let that plan unfold, Lord. And even as we are focused on G12 and, and uh, had a great conversation last time with this person who had visited us, so God is going to increase those conversations and uh, we'll be a blessing to many. You know, I always remember Sam Jabadurai when I think about a preacher of righteousness. And he used to tell us, uh, you know, he used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, go and uh, get ready and go to the trains to distribute tracks. First of all, he'll do street preaching. 4 o'clock in the morning, dawn preaching, right? So he'll go to the streets and, and just preach righteousness in the... I mean, people have not gotten up. I'm sure some people were saying, who is this person disturbing my sleep? You know, and some probably got saved in their sleep, which is really good. But the commitment to be a preacher of righteousness, we learned from Brother Sam Jabadurai, and going for the dawn preaching, Sister Mini, uh, going into the streets and just declaring the gospel. You know, he just, he was, sometimes you might, some people might think, I mean, does he have a problem with this mental health, you know, a preacher of righteousness, you know, going into the streets at four o'clock and then after that going to the trains 
2,000 tracks every day. Simon, 2,000 tracks every day. Think about that. That's not easy. Couple of hours in the train before he went to work. This is not when he was full time. Before he went to work. That's why 4 o'clock, dawn preaching, and then train preaching. You know, go into the trains, each station, get down, go to the next uh, carriage, share the gospel. And then evening, 6 p.m. to the hospital. This is when he was working for income tax and what a heart for God. You know, that's what is needed. You know, God is looking at the heart and as we obey, he will promote us. You know, that's what happened. We always see the end. We always see, wow. God gave him one of the largest ministries in India. There was a price paid. There is always a price paid. You know, we always see the end result. I remember even Pastor Dick, thank God for Pastor Dick, and we have invited him to come and speak here. Hopefully God will move that and get it done next year. And he sold his home and put the proceeds for the church building. You know, that kind of faith. And when he didn't have much, he got a check of $99,000, Sam, and he gave it to a fellow evangelist, asking him, is this enough for your crusade? You know, that is the kind of heart, because it's seed time and harvest. God has not forgotten that. Then he got a $5 million check for the building. Let's give a hand to Bishop Dick Burnell. Um, my pastor and Pastor Jemima's pastor, we were there for almost seven or eight years. Week after week, it was a faith building every week. Especially their worship was really good. And Brian Waller, he was there as well. He was in tears when I was sharing with him that your prophetic word was very useful. And he was prophetically declaring healing uh, for somebody with abdominal pain. I've shared that testimony before, and it was me. I know that because, and I told him he was almost in tears, uh, you know. Uh, thank God for people who have spoken into your lives. Sometimes they need that encouragement. You know, call them and say, hey, I'm thankful for the prayer that you prayed. It has been impactful. Or the counsel that you gave, it has been impactful. You know, Watchman Nee was an amazing man of God in China. And, um, and people told him, he was, I think, living in Hong Kong. And then he decided to go to mainland. And people said, if you go there, you're going to get arrested. Uh, but in that context, he said this. If a mother discovered that her house was on fire and she herself was outside the house doing the laundry, what would she do? Although she realized the danger, would she not rush into the house? Although I know that my return is fraught with dangers, I know that many brothers and sisters are still inside. How can I not return? Now that is a preacher of righteousness. Watchman Nee, I like the name. And Nee is N-E-E, -E, but he was on his knees most of the time. And a preacher of righteousness, being uh, so focused on the assignment that the Lord has given, despite the dangers. You know, it's not easy even today to uh, preach the gospel in China. This was in the 1950s, so it must have been very, very hard. And, and when... He died in prison in uh, 1972, and he left this note. And what did he say? This is what he said. He wanted to testify to the truth which he had given, which he had even until his death with his lifelong experience. He said this, the truth is Christ is the Son of God who died for the redemption of sinners and resurrected after three days. This is the greatest truth in the universe. I die because of my belief in Christ. What an amazing man of God. Let's give a hand for Watchman Nee. You know, these are people with amazing faith who challenge us and who keep pushing us in the right direction, if you will. And this is uh, something Watchman Nee wrote Outside of Christ, I am only a sinner, but in Christ, I am saved. Outside of Christ, I am empty. In Christ, I am full. 
Outside of Christ, I am weak. In Christ, I am strong. Outside of Christ, I cannot. In Christ, I am more than able. Outside of Christ, I have been defeated. In Christ, I am already victorious. I like that. In Christ, I am already victorious. How meaningful are the words in Christ? Watchman Nee. You know, Matthew 24, 37 to 41 talks about, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, and we are living in the last days. We see the signs of the spirit of Antichrist coming. I still believe there is going to be a mighty revival before the Antichrist comes. And we all believe that, but it, is, it was the same situation there. They were saying in verse 38, Matthew 24 says, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. You know, even though Noah was preaching righteousness, nobody was caring. They said, we have never seen a flood. We have never seen rain. What are you talking about? You know, and they were kind of dismissing Noah. It's not, it's not going to happen. Noah, you're wasting your time. And probably they were telling others, don't listen to this old man. You know, but Noah kept at it. Noah kept at it. He believed what God had given him. And that's what is happening now. You know, if you go and tell people, hey, there is a judgment coming, people will say, what are you talking about? You know, I'm fine. I, I work at Google, you know. I have a lot of stock options. I play in the stock market. I have a big bank balance. You know, people, especially in the Bay Area, will have that kind of a mindset. But we need to pray. That's why prayer is so important to change hearts. A heart of stone can be converted to a heart of flesh. That's why we pray for the people. And we need to continue to pray for the souls. Even in the prayer before the service, let's name names and pray. It's important. And that's when their hearts will change. And as we share the gospel and, and, um, and tell them about the impending judgment uh, or revival, if, you're, if we become desperate, we'll see revival. Or God will have to send destruction to send revival. Because, you know, God is righteous. And you see these patterns in scriptures. You know, we can understand the character of God by reading scriptures and looking at incidents and how he responded, you know, he can, he can relent if we repent. And God can change his heart of judgment. But there has to be a repentant heart. And we need to continue to be a preacher of righteousness. I think there is no question about that. And each one has to do it. Even children, be a preacher of righteousness. Share the gospel with other kids in your school, Joven. Do it. Livia, do it. Jerome, do it. Everyone, Jordan. Because that is where we are. There is a toxicity in the schools. And you all see it. Even the kids see it. You know? And that's why we have a very strong children's ministry here in the blessing. We, have, we must have it. And I'm glad we are doing it. Because they will become preachers of righteousness wherever they go. And that's what we are telling even Hannah and Joshua. You need to be a preacher of righteousness there. And live a model life even despite the toxicity. And, and Josh has sent us some things that are so toxic there in the university. And Ash and others, you know what I'm talking about. You have been on campus. And you too, brother. There is so much toxicity on campuses. We have a couple of teachers here. You know, even in Christian schools, there is a lot of toxicity. So I think God has sent you as ambassadors to pray and intercede and train our kids to be preachers of righteousness. God will do a mighty work. Proverbs 1, 32 and 33 says, For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. You know, even though we live in a toxic environment, God is promising all of us. 
whoever listens to me will dwell safely. Say with me, I will dwell safely. I will dwell safely. You know, whatever happens around you, God will make sure you will dwell safely and will give, provide for all the needs. It might not even add up. The numbers might not add up. But provision is guaranteed for you. Provision is guaranteed for you. Security is guaranteed for you. A safe dwelling is guaranteed for you without fear of evil. You know, that's why to live a life like Noah, a life of faith, a life to be a preacher of righteousness, understanding the covenant and the promises that the Lord has given. You know, he doesn't promise just like that. When he has given you a promise, it's for real. Just believe it. Continue in it. Walk by faith. Continue to believe the promise. Continue to believe the vision. Provision will come. And your vision that God has put on your heart will come to pass. Let's all stand up. Thank you, Jesus, for Noah. I, I, I'm starting to love Noah more, uh, especially his faith walk. I've been thinking about the 120 years of building the ark and being a preacher of righteousness right from that same mountain. And people probably were passing by and going about their business, you know, uh, buying and selling or um, marrying and giving in marriage and doing all the things that they needed to do. And nobody really turned to the Lord. And, you know, but when the rain started, I believe many came. Many came to the ark and they couldn't find a door to get in. Because the Lord shut them in. The word of God says that the Lord shut the door of the ark. And we all need to be a preacher of righteousness. Let's do the decree. God is good. God is going to use us in a mighty way to bless the nation. We have an amazing covenant. Of course, the new covenant is much better. Thank God for the Noahic covenant as well because it's still valid for us today. So let's do the decree. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The covenant with Noah is also a covenant with me. Let's repeat that. The covenant with Noah is also a covenant with me. Covenant with Noah is still applicable to us. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Let's add, I will be a preacher of righteousness. The ark also represents the church and we need to be a preacher of righteousness to rescue the lost. America shall be healed saved and delivered. Let's pray. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Master, for this wonderful morning, amazing service, amazing worship, amazing prophetic word, amazing time of offering, and amazing time of uh, praising uh, God for the praise points. Amazing time of scripture reading, even the announcements. Thank you for leading us and let your presence be with us always. Thank you, Lord. Those who are watching online, I don't like to close any service without sharing the gospel. You know, we talked about the covenant with Noah um, and 
Of course, it's applicable to you as well, but I want to talk to you about the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ that gives you eternal life. It's a gift. It's a free gift. And it's a contract where your portion of the contract is just a few sentences and God's portion of the contract is this book. So it's, it's absolutely a no-brainer contract to sign, if I may use that term, because there's so many promises that he promised you, but you need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. And I'm going to pray and pray with me. If you agree to that, then you are a new creation as well. Heavenly Father, I do not know about this new covenant but I want to know about this new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. If you agree to that prayer, then you're a new creation. Be part of the Blessing Church here in the Bay Area, and God will bless you even as you come into the kingdom. You will reap benefits on a daily basis. Thank you, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.